All right, uh, so I figured with the topic of mutiny and kind of where everybody thinks we're going to go with it, uh, we should have at least one talk in the first half that covers a ship. Yes! Yeah. Yeah, make sure. There's going to be a lot of ships in this. We need to make sure we get it through. Everybody good? Everybody good? Cool. Moving on. <laughs> All right, so the ship... Thank you. The ship that we're going to be talking about quite a bit tonight is the Medusa, a French frigate. Uh, it was commissioned in 1810 and was uh, used largely throughout the Napoleonic Wars, uh, immediately after which it became a ferry in 1816. Uh, when it was uh, meant to take a bunch of French officials to St. Louis and Senegal as part of the imperialism game with British handing off Senegal to the French. Um, everything else that I tell you in the story is predicated on one important fact. Uh, the captain of the ship, Viscount Chaumet, is an idiot. That's important. Nothing makes sense unless you recognize this man is dumb. Or at least ill-equipped to captain a ship. So... Uh, the original course uh, was supposed to go from uh, Madeira uh, to um, Senegal. Uh, it didn't quite make it. Uh, the Medusa had a total uh, complement of 400 with about 160 crew. Uh, and for reasons that are beyond me, uh, our captain decided that a man named Richfort, who was a philosopher, should be the navigator. He said he knew a lot about it. Um, and uh, he mistake some clouds. Uh, for Africa, <laughs> specifically uh, the Cape of Bucco in Mauritania, uh, and drastically underestimated where they were, which wouldn't be so bad if they were with the other four vessels that was traveling with them, um, but they weren't, because the captain was like, we can make better time, we're a much faster ship. So they ditched those guys right out of port, um, and abruptly and uh, kind of obviously uh, hit a sandbar, about 30 miles off the coast of Mauritania, uh, and they hit it during high tide which is a bad sign. So they're having a lot of trouble refloating this boat, especially because the captain was very uninterested in ditching his cannons, which weighed about 85 or uh, 84,000 pounds. Uh, and he was like, nah, we don't need to do that. Um, and because this is a story about a shipwreck, uh, there are not enough lifeboats, <laughs> obviously. Uh, they could only take about half the people. Um, and it's 30 miles over rough waters. They don't want to make two trips. So they have a new idea. They're like, we're going to make a raft, like a really shitty one recognizably. Like, they didn't try to make it good. And the whole idea was that they would just take all the cargo, put it on the raft, refloat the boat, and then put everything back on. It would be great. And that would have worked, except for on July 5th, the next day, a gale threatened to break the boat apart, and there was mass hysteria. <laughs> so the captain was like, we need to get the hell's bells out. Uh, and he loads everybody of prominence, importance, and with a little bit of money onto those lifeboats, and they were like, okay, dudes, everybody else onto this raft and we'll tow you to shore. It's going to be great. Don't even worry about it. Infrastructure like you wouldn't believe. Um, so 146 men and one woman uh, pile onto this raft. And they set out for shore. And then all the people on the lifeboats are like, oh, shit. Lifeboats aren't equipped to pull a raft with 146 people, 147 people on it. Uh, and basically immediately cut the rope. Like, just immediately. Like, minutes. Not hours, not days, minutes. Uh, and this raft was not designed with any way to propel itself. It did not have any means of steering. Um, and to make matters worse, they had about a day's worth of rations of ship's biscuits, and most of the containers which they believed to be water were wine. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's really bad. So in the first night, one night, 20 people are either killed or commit suicide. Uh, over the rough seas, only the middle of the raft stays afloat entirely out of water, and there's just a struggle to stay on there for days. Um, people get drunk and fall off the boat. Cannibalism starts on the fourth day. Oh. <laughs> on the eighth day, four days of cannibalism, the fittest people left are like, this is not going well. We need to conserve our rations, which are cannibalism. Uh, <laughs> So they throw all of the remaining infirmed people off the boat. All 15 people who are left after this action are going to survive until uh, July 17th. That's 12 days on the raft, when one of the other boats in the convoy finds them by chance. No one went looking. No one knew this happened. They didn't report it. They just left it out there. So these, uh, these um, 15 people are saved. Uh, five more die within days of being rescued. Uh, so, 
that's that. Uh, and you guys might be like, I didn't hear much about mutiny. And that's because the real mutiny happens after these events in, oh, what, more art. More art? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Given tonight, that's a thing now. All right, totally a thing. Cool. Um, so, in a lot of these talks, art. In a lot of these talks, we kind of use historical paintings as a means of explanation. But, you know, there's an actual huge story that goes on with a lot of these. No more so than this, um, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. Uh, it took him two years to produce. He basically heard this story, was so incensed that he's like, at 25, this is going to be my, like, big thing that I do to get known. Um, and it's an uncommissioned work, and it's huge. It's massive. Like, this is not as big as it is. This is as big as it is. It's 16 by 24 feet. Um, just a huge, huge work. Um, and it marks kind of the beginning of the Romantic era. Um, but it sits right at the precipice, where it still holds on to a lot of, like, what was happening beforehand, which was neoclassical. Um, so to look at that a little bit, like, this is a, a huge, giant neoclassical painting, um, similar to the size of, like, a Jericho. Um, and it is, you know, this is the Oath of the Horatii, and it's a historical story. It is made to embolden and uh, talk about the clout of the people who had it made, and it tells the story of heroic, muscly, perfect dudes. That's what's going on. Coming next, romanticism. More realistic people, high emotions, and naked women. Generally naked women, lots of them. Not specific women, but idea women. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is a Delacroix, and you can't tell me that uh, Delacroix, who was a friend and student of Jericho, didn't get some ideas about framing from him. But yeah, so, so Jericho, he spends years on this, sketch after sketch after sketch. He gets corpses from a local morgue so he can see how flesh putrefies. He does life drawings of friends. Uh, he does the composition over and over and over until we get this final work. Um, just a couple of seconds on the composition of it, which is pretty incredible. It doesn't have a center. Instead, it's built on these two pyramids. Um, in each of them, like, kind of moves the eye along. Uh, the first showing the despair, moving to the salvation, and then that kind of points you to something you guys probably missed, but a tiny, tiny boot in this huge, huge piece that is their salvation coming. Um, ship. <laughs> but, like... All of the action is happening on this raft, so much so that you probably didn't even notice the huge tidal wave that's about to come on the other side of the piece. Um, so this was unveiled at the Paris Salon of 1819 to really mixed reviews. Um, to understand why those reviews were mixed, we also need some historical context. And I'm sorry, we're going to do this quick. Does anybody here know a lot about Napoleonic era France? Great. So you are not going to like this part of the talk. And anybody who has more questions about it should see that person. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, uh, 1789, the French Revolution starts. 1791, Jericho's born. 1799, uh, Napoleon overthrows uh, the Directory, which is a cool name, uh, in a bloodless coup d'etat, uh, and the revolution is basically over. Uh, 1801, uh, France ends its participation in slavery. Uh, 1802, the, foreign le or the Legion of Honor is formed. That's not important to the talk, but it's just cool. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Napoleon crowns himself in 1804. Between 1814 and 1815, Napoleon's exiled a couple of times. But finally, the monarchy is restored, this time as a constitutional monarchy, under uh, Louis XVIII, who is a Bourbon and a very conservative monarch. So... And then we get to the, salon, or the voyage in 1816 of the Medusa and our salon in 1819. So relatively contemporary, much more so than you would get from a true history painting. And we get this painting. So now, why was it controversial? Well, one, a lot of critics were like, uh, it's a bunch of dead people. That's not pretty. Like, that's not really what art's supposed to be. Uh, but other than that, um, there's politics all over this. Jericho uh, was a huge um, abolitionist. Uh, and so it's no, um, it's no, what is the word? Coincidence, Coincidence that the uh, main heroic figure uh, is the only um, black man who survived. Uh, also, uh, the reason that our captain was there was because after uh, Napoleon was ousted, uh, he got his appointment through politics. 
Um, it was a political appointment, and he uh, was incompetent, and it basically became shorthand for being anti-monarchy, anti-Bourbon. So all of this politics was going on here, and that just wasn't what art was at the time. And so I have a question, and I'm legitimately asking, why does everyone think, anybody can shout, why did he paint this? That's why. He painted it because there was now an audience for it. And this is the mutiny we're talking about. Culture is changing. The patronage system is breaking down. Massive, fine works are no longer just for the church, the state, and incredibly wealthy people. There's an appetite this, for this in the middle class. So even though it looked kind of like that neoclassical work that was there, it's actually ideologically more similar to an Oliver Stone movie than it would be to any art that came before. Um, to kind of further this point, uh, it was so controversial that uh, the Louvre did not purchase the work after the salon. And instead, he's like, screw it. He shent, sent it to uh, the UK, and he made twice as much as he would have selling it to a museum through ticket sales for just people who wanted to see this controversial work. And that's basically from this flashpoint how art progresses in Western society. You had, actually, our last talk goes over this quite a bit. Um, you had like the Barbizon school and people who did things that would appeal to a middle class sensibility without any sort of um, political weight to it. It's just pretty. It classes up any house, right? <laughs> Much like the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> no, nobody has a problem with the Great British Bake Off. It's great, right? Uh, or you can go the other way that you attract the middle class. That's right, naked people and violence, right? <laughs> Very contemporaneous. So this work is at that moment. This is the time when an artist got autonomy to kind of do what they wanted and knew that they could find an audience for that and make money doing it, which is why it also still feels incredibly relevant. You can look at this and you can think about the refugee crisis, you can think about our current state of government, and you wouldn't be that off of what the artist intended you to think about when you looked at the work, um, which is why I think it's still referenced so much uh, Banksy, Martin uh, Kippenberg, John Cornell, this is evidently Paul McCartney's favorite painting, Max Ernst, uh, uh, Louis Fishman, uh, even Doctor Who, and the Pogues have uh, all referenced this painting. Um, so I kind of want to do a counterpoint to, to our last talk uh, and just say to uh, the autonomy of artists to create and know that they can get paid. <laughs>